Oh. Let's see, I can't hear you. Someone want to unmute themselves and let me know if you yes. can see it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Yes. I, I'm new to Microsoft Teams, so I'm more of a Zoom person. All right. Well, thank you for everyone um, that showed up today. I look forward to at some point meeting you all in person, um, but for now, really nice to meet you virtually. And I look forward to uh, getting to you know, discuss these issues with you guys and hear more um, about the specifics of what you face on a daily basis dealing with people. So today, as Chris mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about the human side of human wildlife conflict. And I've been lucky enough to work with African lions, now excited to work with lions here. Um, but I think African lions are a really great species in thinking about these issues um, because while tourists absolutely love to see them and you know everyone loves photographing lions, um, they do pose a real threat to both people and livestock. And I got a lot of experience in how do you try to reconcile um, the different groups and the different perspectives uh, to deal with um, different species that have very polarizing, um, or people have very polarizing views of what to do. So as Chris mentioned, uh, I'm a new human wildlife interactions advisor at UC ANR, otherwise known as Cooperative Extension. I started end of February, still getting a lay of the land. I'm based over at UC Elkis Ranch at Half Moon Bay, but my position covers actually seven counties throughout the Bay Area. So it's quite a right, wide geographic scope. Um, I look forward to getting to work with you guys in the future. And <laughs> I included a photo of my dog here just because I feel like it's more a question of when than if she will try to interrupt this presentation. Um, she has a terrible habit of barking or whining. <laughs> so. If you hear that, apologies. Um, that's the the face to the name, the face to the sound. You may hear later. So my background has been focused on human wildlife conflict issues. Um, specifically, I've worked for many years in Southern Africa. Um, so my work included, you know, camera traps, um, breeding livestock guardian dogs, doing questionnaire surveys of ranchers, uh, deploying GPS collars to study carnivore movements, um, and really trying to understand the perspectives of the people that are living on a daily basis with um, these different wildlife species and the challenges they face. Um, all and all the data collection with the overarching aim of how can we try to mitigate this conflict um, and you know improve the lives both of the people but also of the wildlife in these areas. So I did my master's and PhD in ecology through UC Davis um, and look forward to, you know, continuing to do great work um, with a wide range of wildlife species. Uh, I incorporated this photo just on the upper left to give a sense of how severe conflict can be in many areas. So, I mean, we darted that lion and in the five minutes it took to fall asleep, it managed to find and kill a cow. Um, so I think that photo perfectly encapsulates um, just how big of an issue these things can be. I grew up in California, so I'm really excited to be back um, and getting to work with really fantastic colleagues over at UCA and R. I'm sure you guys know many of them, um, but here we are uh, doing some camera trapping work, studying livestock guardian dogs up, uh, in Truckee. If anyone wants to talk about livestock guardian dogs later, um, let me know. That's something I am very interested and passionate about. All right, so humans. In terms of human wildlife conflict, they are certainly half, if not more, of the equation. And really the question is, how do we address conflict and try to change human behavior? And how can we start these conversations with people, acknowledging that decisions that people make aren't purely based on logic, right? Um, you have to take into account, you know, emotions, people's history. Um, it, it's complicated when trying to, you know, tell a person not to feed a squirrel or, you know, the, the, the trap they're trying to set actually isn't legal. Um, and it's important that we best know how to um, bring ourselves to the conversation to increase our odds of actually changing behavior um, and forming the relationships that are necessary to make changes. And before getting into any of the details, I do want to mention 
that it's really important when addressing any of these conflict issues or you know, certainly compliance, if you're an, um, an officer that's you know, gonna write a ticket for someone, say feeding wildlife when it's illegal to do so. I would suggest making sure first that is everyone talking about the same thing? And I only mention this because I had a really interesting conversation with a researcher in Utah a few months back at the vertebrate pest conference. And she was saying that they had done research on why people were feeding wildlife in parks. And I mean, there are signs everywhere that say, please don't feed wildlife. And what she found was that actually some cultures didn't view squirrels as wildlife. They viewed them as something separate. So they're like, oh yeah, I saw the sign that said, do not feed wildlife, but I'm not feeding wildlife, I'm feeding a squirrel. And that really jumped out at me because you know, when dealing with people, it's so important to make sure that we're not just imposing our belief system on other people. And you may be thinking you're talking about the same thing, but you're totally talking past each other. Um, so I encourage everyone to, you know, when we're dealing with these issues, take a moment to make sure and you know, clarify um, with whoever it is you're talking about that I mean, did they even understand what the rules were first? Because um, maybe you know, it was nothing purposeful that they were doing. It was completely, you know, they thought they were doing the right thing, but in fact, they weren't. Um, so I just really found that fascinating and I encourage you to consider that. All right, so when we're dealing with members of the public or different agencies or people in general, I know it's, you know, Face value, of course, everyone listens, but there's a difference between hearing and listening. And that's a really important difference when we're talking about conflict. So much of approaching a situation is about how you're listening to the other person or the other group. And when you're hearing stories or you're hearing you know, situations or people's reasons for what they're doing, you can view it in terms of three different aspects of what the story is or what the person is saying. So you can view it in terms of values. So what are the values underlying what this person is describing? You can view it in terms of their feelings. So what are their underlying emotions that they're bringing to the conversation? And third, what are the basic facts? And this is the facts is what people often jump to. And that's what we first are listening for um, when someone's explaining something to us. And that for some people is going to be the easiest, kind of the go-to thing. Um, I've heard often to people that are working a lot with compliance, um, you know, and that's what they're looking for are what exactly did the person do and was it following the rules? But in fact, it's really important to also be looking for what the values and what the feelings are and not just the facts in when you're listening to someone describe something because that's going to help you better understand where that person is coming from and will help you as i discuss later in how to frame a response um, that's going to increase the chances of success in forming a relationship that can actually affect change and if you haven't already heard of william urey um, he does some really great work. He has a great TED talk, um, but he is all about the power of listening. And kind of how he describes it is that instead of, you know, peace talks, it really should be like peace listening, because that is such a critical aspect in working towards a resolution with someone who has potentially very different views from your own. And he gives three big reasons for the power of listening. And it's first, by listening, you're going to make it more likely that the other person will listen to you, which is critical. Second, listening is going to help you understand the other person. And third, and perhaps most importantly, it's going to help you to connect with the other person or group and to build trust. And that's really the foundation you need going forward in addressing uh, conflict. And of course, there's also empathy, which is perhaps just as important and will help you um, in listening to other people. And I know it can be easier, like, oh, of course, be empathetic, but and it's it is challenging, right? So I don't want to minimize how hard it can be sometimes, given certain situations, to dig deep and really empathize with the group um, that you're trying to work with. 
And Dr. Brene Brown um, categorizes empathy into four you know, main group or main points. So first, it's about perspective taking. So are you able to put yourselves in the other person's shoes um, and try to view the problem from how they are viewing it? Second, staying out of judgment. So just really trying to listen to what the other person or group is saying without putting your own emotions and judgment onto what they're saying. Third, recognize emotion in other people. So have that emotional intelligence um, to be able to think through and see what the other person and understand what the other person is feeling. And then fourth, communication, really feeling with people. And if you're interested in learning more about empathy, which I would highly recommend, um, Dr. Brene Brown also has video she's created that you can, if you just Google her name, it'll come up um, and goes much further into depth. I mean, you could do an entire hour just on empathy um, and how important it is. So I'd really recommend working on that. Um, and Dr. Brene Brown suggests, which I think is great and I often catch myself doing, is not starting with saying at least. So if someone is complaining to you, you know, about all this damage that, uh, you know, ground squirrel has caused um, or the rats eating their vegetables, a response that's like, well, at least you have one tomato left, um, that's not gonna help, that's not empathy. Um, and that isn't gonna make the person feel like you really are understanding where they are um, and what they're feeling in that moment. And empathy is really, um, you know, to summarize, a about connection, not a response. And that's what makes something better. Um, and I, people, I believe they want to be heard. And especially with a lot of these wildlife issues, um, you know, people are frustrated. They don't know how to solve their problems or they don't realize that their actions are actually, you know, exacerbating issues for other people or for the city. Um, but really, you know, trying to listen, trying to understand, trying to connect with them is going to be so important if you actually want to change someone's mind and behavior. And when you're being empathetic, you always need to be present. So be in the moment. Um, don't be distracted. Don't be guessing, you know, oh, but they're not going to listen anyway. You know, be present um, and try to have a positive attitude and move the communication forward. And it's really an intentional choice. Um, you need to be thinking about being empathetic. It's probably not going to come naturally for a lot of these situations um, where, you know, potentially a person's being very difficult that you're trying to work with. Um, but by working on it, um, it'll only help you and only help the relationship. And I mean, I catch myself doing this where you hear about damage. Um, and in the moment, it, you're like, okay, so ground squirrel ate some of your fruit. Like, and people are really, really livid. Um, so I deal with people, I'm sure you guys do too. And they're at their complete wits end. Uh, they don't know how to stop, you know, different rodents or coyotes from causing damage in their house. And they are really, really upset. But I mean, I get it, right? I have also lost vegetables that I've put so much effort into and so much love and care. And then overnight, uh, or just, you know, one morning, it's all gone. Um, so just really working to try to see the from their perspective, um, even acknowledging what people are going through will really help open up the conversation for them to later on listen to you. So there are gonna be different types of conflict and some are gonna be more deep seated than others. So I, I'm excited um, at the end of the presentation to get to talk with you guys more um, about the specific types of conflicts that you regularly encounter um, in your work. But I wanted to touch upon how to go about trying to address deep seated conflict. So maybe there are a few groups within the community that feel very, very strongly in highly polarized ways about how they want to manage, um, let's say coyotes or ground squirrels. Um, how are you going to try to move this forward um, and actually try to work together or try to, um, you know, get people to stop doing an action that has been going on for years um, and you just feel like, you know, the solution or the problem isn't going anywhere. How can you take a step back and address it? Well, first, 
I would recommend um, viewing the conflict through the different layers that make it up. So the Center for Conservation Peace Building is a really great resource and they describe conflict as these three levels. So first you have the dispute. So that's um, the actual um, like friction that you're trying to resolve. So let's say someone feeding a wild animal or yeah, doing something that they're not supposed to be doing or you don't want them to. You then have the underlying conflict that's underneath the dispute. So you aren't necessarily directly trying to resolve that underlying conflict, but it is directly relating how you're going to be able to resolve the dispute. And under that, you have identity-based conflict. So this is people's history, people's identity, their sense of self, and how they bring that with them into the dispute. And that's all gonna um, impact each other. And you can't separate out these three different levels. And a good way to think about this, to understand the concept is, let's say there's a fender bender. So you have this car accident, and both drivers get out. And so the dispute is this accident happened. Now who's going to pay for it? Now, if it's two people come out and they're best friends and they're coming from you know, a brunch that they had together, they're probably going to be fairly amicable in how they settle this dispute. Um, and because they have that positive relationship. So the underlying conflict, if you're good friends, in this case, um, you know, it's actually in a positive way. You have a relationship with this person. You don't want to hurt them. You don't want to hurt their feelings. So you're going to be more open um, to resolving it in a positive way. But then imagine if the two people that are in this car accident are going through a very terrible divorce. You can imagine that how they are going to approach this dispute is going to be vastly different from two friends. And so that's a situation where that divorce is the underlying conflict. And you can't necessarily parse apart those feelings about each other in settling the dispute. So you need to take that into account and realize that history and that baggage that the people are bringing to solving this issue. Now imagine you have two drivers where one is wearing, you know, a Trump hat. And the other person is, you know, a huge Biden fan and is wearing a Biden shirt. So now you have these two people who've never met, don't know each other, but just are able to make a split second judgment based on what the other person is wearing. And be, based on that judgment, they assume they understand that other person's identity and they know that it is very offend offensive given their own identity. So in that instance, we have this even deeper rooted identity based conflict, and they're going to bring those assumptions about that other group, that other person with them as they're settling a dispute. And you can also imagine this, you know, if you are someone who's in a uniform and is trying to um, address someone, you know, feeding a squirrel in a park and you confront that person, you don't know what that a uh, member of the public's experience is with people in uniform. So potentially you immediately, just based on what you're wearing and what your position is, um, are gonna have this identity-based conflict um, that you need to take into account in settling the dispute. Even though it's completely unrelated in your mind, it really is gonna affect how the two sides interact. And when we're addressing deep-seated conflict, you need to think about, are you playing a finite game or an infinite game? And again, this is out of um, Center for Conservation Peace Building. And I think this is so fascinating how they um, tie this in with conservation work, where a finite game, the goal is to win. So you're in a dispute and you want to win. You want your side to get its way. Whereas in an infinite game, the goal is to keep playing. So it's a much longer term thing you're trying to, like you're trying to accomplish more, let's say in an infinite game, like tolerance towards a predator um, versus winning one rule that maybe you know, affects um, management for you know, 
that species. So as you're approaching these sorts of issues, and of course it's gonna vary depending on what the conflict is. So this may or may not relate to um, what you're dealing with right now, um, but you wanna think through that are you potentially sacrificing a long-term relationship for one win? And is that worth it? Um, developing relationships takes a lot of time and it can pay off in the long run, but in order to play that infinite game, you need to think through what are you willing to give up in order to achieve this longer term win um, or ability to keep playing the game indefinitely. And this can be really important, um, you know, as agencies or different groups trying to reconcile with other groups or the public, um, you know, see this a lot, you know, like wolf conservation, I think is a really great example where you have these um, very entrenched sides in, you know, ranchers not wanting them there. And then you have the conservationists that are so glad that the federal government re uh, reintroduced them. And there it's really deeply rooted. Um, but in order, you know, for what's best for everyone, you really got to keep playing and keep developing those relationships to go forward. So on a finer scale versus the you know overarching a drum looking at or how to look at conflict when you're actually on a day-to-day -day basis let's say you're driving out to go um, to someone's house to address you know, a concern they have um, or you have a concern for what they're doing a really great way to view what you're going to talk about is through naming and framing the situation so Naming the situation is identifying what needs attention. And this is a really great way, um, looping back to making sure you're all on the same page and you're talking about the same thing, to make sure that you're actually talking about the same thing. Uh, second is, or next is framing. So this is where you're going to define the situation in a way that connects and welcomes others. So I would, you know, at the end, love if you guys wouldn't mind um, thinking through some of the challenges and conflicts that you guys face and how you might name and frame them in a more positive way that may open up people to listening. So when I was thinking this, thinking through like what are potential issues, um, you know, that you guys may face. I know I deal a lot with coyotes. I'll be curious to hear um, if you guys also get a lot of calls about coyotes. But let's say you have someone who um, the neighbors are reporting that they're feeding the coyotes actively. And so you're driving over there and, you know, probably a little bit anxious, um, probably, you know, potentially nervous. You think this is going to be contentious with this person. First, think through how you're feeling, right? With any relationship, if there's any kinds of tension, really trying to look inward first and making sure that you're in the right state of mind, it's going to be incredibly helpful for then bringing your best self and really bringing your ability to be open to listen to the other person. But naming and framing comes in with how you're going to approach the person and try to open up a discussion. So a positive way to name and frame could be something like, and I mean, there are multitude, many, many ways that you could phrase this, but one I came up with would be naming, uh, would be saying, I've been getting reports that the coyotes are spending a lot of time at your house um, and maybe finding food here. And then framing would be, you know, I think it's great that you must, or you must love wildlife. I know I do too, and I love seeing animals. I just wanna make sure that we can work together and make sure that we're doing what's best for both the coyotes and the kids that are playing in the neighborhood. And so million ways you could tweak it, but the idea being you're not accusing them of anything straight out and you're trying to encourage them to work with you to together come up with something or solution um, that benefits their love of animals but also helps introduce the idea that, you know, there's a public or a potential safety hazard and threat to the long-term health of these animals if this action continues. So can we talk about this? Yeah. 
And of course, long term, as you guys know, education is so important um, for trying to increase people's tolerance for wildlife, also decrease fear. That's been really interesting for me where in the Bay Area, I've come across a lot more fear of these animals. Um, whereas the conflict that I was working on in Southern Africa was very much, you know, livestock depredation focused. Um, seems to be, you know, quite a big difference in terms of the people I interacted with over there. Um, you know, people had a greater knowledge and were more uh, tied to wildlife. They'd spend a lot more time outdoors or out in the bush, um, knew the animals quite well. Whereas many people I find here, you know, they like animals, they like wildlife, um, but they're not sure how to respond to, um, you know, a coyote being in their yard or just knowing that a mountain lion could be in the area at some point um, because they live along the wildland um, urban interface and they're very fearful about that potential. Um, and I think a lot of that stems from you know, not necessarily having a strong understanding of the animal's biology um, and not knowing how to respond to a specific wildlife species if they come across it. And also educating people on the local laws and regulations. Um, you know, I find a lot of times people don't realize that what they're doing actually is illegal. Um, probably the most common in terms of that is drowning. I can't tell you how many times people are like, oh yeah, I just catch this, you know, squirrel or like possum in a live trap and I dispose of it by drowning. It's like, okay, well that's first off illegal in California. So please stop doing that. Um, and it's not humane and the people have no idea and they feel terrible when they learn that. Um, but it's just getting the information out so that people can make the best choices um, and know how to approach these different animal species. And I know with COVID and everything, certainly <laughs> schools are uh, different, uh, look very different these days. I know personally, I look forward to um, trying to get involved with more school groups through my position once that's possible um, in the Bay Area. But don't minimize um, your ability just to talk to people, you know, that you live near um, or your friends and family. And, you know, every little bit helps to, you know, help educate people on these different animals um, and what to do if you do encounter them or how to effectively manage them. Um, so I, I think Chris mentioned that you guys, you know, recently had, or I'm sure you regularly get talks on you know, burrowing rodent management, all that good stuff. Um, so you're well-informed and please help spread the word um, so that people can make the most effective and legal and humane choices. So Chris had mentioned that feeding wildlife um, is often an issue that uh, many of you face. So I look forward to talking with you further about that during the discussion. Um, this, is a, a big problem to tackle, absolutely. And I mean, here I am as a kid, I was totally contributing to this problem, right, um, un unwittingly. And so I think a lot of, you know, certainly education comes down uh, to trying to change this problem. But as I'm sure you're aware, feeding wildlife is illegal in San Francisco, um, but depending mm -hmm. upon where you're living, what city and county, know the local laws, um, of course, levels of enforcement. I'm not sure how much this is enforced. Um, I'm sure it'll really you know, vary widely and we could have a whole discussion on whether uh, or what types of enforcement are most effective or um, you know, discussions over the equity um, of having you know, tickets, um, that sort of thing. I know that's a hot topic you know, with dogs off leash is how do you try to change that behavior and you know, do you give really high fines um, or is that, you know, potentially a really inequitable way to approach the problem? Um, does it actually shift behavior? Um, I'd love to chat with you guys further about that later. Um, but I do want to say that, you know, trying to understand why the person is doing it and address those drivers is going to be really important. And this ties right back into naming and framing. Um, being explicit with this person or group about what it is they're doing. They're 
feeding the animals um, and why they're doing it, because it might be that they think they're helping. Um, and simply by knowing that in fact, what they're doing can actually be highly detrimental um, to the animal that they're feeding, um, that may be in and of itself enough to get them to change their behavior. I know I've, I've certainly encountered this so far in this position where, you know, I had people reach out to me, they had gray foxes that created a den underneath their deck. They were so excited. They loved watching these guys. Um, and, you know, then at some point they didn't see the parents for a day or two and they got very concerned. They're like, should we start leaving out food for the pups? Like, because we don't want them to starve. And explaining that, no, actually, if you start feeding these animals, you're potentially setting them up for huge problems down the road. Um, you, you need to just let nature take its course, even though it can be hard. Um, you don't want to teach these animals to associate people with food. Um, and that was a very quick, like, oh, okay, like we don't want to, we want to do what's best for these animals. So we, we won't feed them. Um, of course, other people, it's going to be, you know, more of a long running uh, conflict potentially, and just really trying to um, take a step back, listen, understand what their viewpoint is, um, and try to go from there. Realizing that, you know, it may not be one conversation and everything's solved, right? And I think having those realistic expectations as we address these different problems is perhaps just as important as everything else. Um, keep in mind that this can be a very slow process, um, but if you don't rush things, you're probably, uh, hopefully, gonna be more effective in the long run. So I wanted to kind of switch gears. I know that was a kind of brief overview on a lot of topics, so uh, please in the discussion, let me know if any of those really jumped out at you and you'd like to talk further about them. Um, but as a wildlife biologist, of course, I'll always have to <laughs> talk about animals at some point. Um, and I, I, I did want to briefly touch upon coyotes because that's something that I've really um, been faced with a lot of questions about from the general public. And I do think that understanding coyote behavior in these urban and suburban areas is really important um, to con and being able to convey that to members of the public so that people know uh, what they should be concerned about and what they don't need to be concerned about. And I mean, coyotes are here to stay. They are in you know most major cities. Um, they're so adaptable, and they're they're not always causing problems, right? Um, you can have plenty of coyotes living in these suburban areas, and it's fine. Um, but helping people um, change their behavior to minimize the potential for conflict is going to be really key um, for humans to live alongside these animals. So a bit about coyote biology is they can be solitary or in packs. And many people think that coyotes are solely solitary, but that actually isn't true. Um, you often can find them in packs and that's completely normal. Um, these packs are made up of family groups. The territory size can vary widely based on resource availability and sex. So if they have really dependent food source, let's say in a um, you know, city park, uh, they may not need to go much further. And I actually have a colleague down in Southern California, I'll be touching upon um, that research in a few slides, but she's been collaring coyotes and she has one, I mean, that home, the home range of it is less than one square mile. Um, so it can really be a huge variety, it depends on where the food is, um, but I, that's fascinating. They're just so adaptable to being able to live um, in these suburban and urban areas. So their lifespan also is gonna vary widely um, depending upon the sources of an, uh, anthropogenic mortality. So typically they live eight to 10 years in the wild. Um, although in Chicago and the urban coyotes there, they actually found that much shorter lifespan because uh, car mortality is so, mortality due to cars is so high. So they typically only live three years. Um, but again, quite variable there. So someone could have a, you know the same group or single coyote living in their neighborhood for quite a long time. Coyotes are really the ultimate opportunistic omnivore, and that's what's allowed them to be able to uh, move into these areas where we have so many people. 
they primarily eat small rodents and mammals, but also they'll eat vegetation, they'll eat fruits. So the you know, beautiful fruit trees people will plant that can be feeding coyotes. Um, they'll eat nuts, they'll eat berries, insects, eggs, birds. So backyard poultry really need to protect them from coyotes. I'm happy to touch upon um, different ways that people can, uh, can be protecting them, the poultry. Uh, they'll eat amphibians, reptiles, carrion, deer, and of course pets. And that's what people um, typically have the most fear about. And some of that is very, should be fearful. Um, outdoor cats are highly susceptible uh, to coyotes and really, you know, if someone 100% wants to protect their cat, they should keep them indoors. Um, feral cat colonies. So there's some really interesting research going on um, looking at coyote diet in relation to known feral cat colonies. So I'd, I'd love to hear more um, in San Francisco. I'm guessing they're I'm sure there are at least some feral cat colonies. I know I've just heard more about them in the East Bay and like up in Marin. Um, but that can be potentially a really big food source for coyotes. Um, so realizing that, you know, if you are, if people are feeding these feral cats, um, you potentially could be indirectly encouraging coyotes to stay in that area. So urban behavior. Coyotes are generally shy around humans. But in some areas, they have lost or are losing their fear. And when they begin associating humans with food, they may start acting aggressive. So in general, Southern California um, has a higher incidence of coyote bites on humans. Luckily, the Bay Area doesn't have that same issue, at least right now. Um, you know, earlier in the year, there was that child that was bitten in the East Bay. So it's, we're not completely free from, from issues. Um, and really, a lot of the bites, is, I don't, I'm not sure about the East Bay one, but certainly in Southern California, when um, people have gone in and, you know, learned more about what that coyote was doing before the bite and kind of what the area was like, um, they often find that that coyote had been having access to some kind of human food in the area. So there does seem to be a strong relationship between coyotes who are associating people with food and then um, proceeding to, you know, not have any fear and bite someone. So just trying to prevent people um, from causing that association is hard, but is really important and it's going to pay off in the long run because that'll, you know, be vastly important in terms of minimizing the potential um, for real conflict and public safety issues. So uh, this is off of the UC pest notes on coyotes. Um, but we have here is just an increasing kind of code, like, you know, if we're envisioning green to red or just increasing um, changes in coyote behavior that indicate an increasing risk to human safety. Um, and this can be useful for people. So you know, if you are contacted about coyotes, you can um, direct them to the UC IPM site on it, but it goes through kind of what are the normal or behaviors that you shouldn't be very concerned about all the way through to, you know, coyotes acting aggressively towards adults in the middle of the day, um, just kind of the highest level of alert. Um, but this can be helpful for people and realizing that, you know, seeing a coyote at night or even, you know, morning, evening is not in and of itself cause for concern. Um, coyotes do live here. Um, and so you will occasionally see them, but some people, you know, they'll see one 200 meters away and they're still terrified and really explaining to that person that, you know what, if the coyote is off doing its own behavior, or, you know, maybe is lying down far away, looking at you, you're okay. It's just checking you out the same way you're checking them out. Um, and just really trying to help people understand what is normal and then what is concerning behavior. And coyote reproduction is really important because this is when you often will get um, the most calls from the public because there is a you know, potential change in behavior of the coyotes during this time. So they breed once per year, anywhere from January through March, and they excavate dens, but will also use culverts, hollow logs, rock piles, you know, under someone's deck, under someone's house, if there's an opening, um, they're pretty adaptable 
Gestation is around 60 days with an average litter size of around six, um, which will depend upon food availability and population density. And pups are born between March and May. And that's when you may have coyotes acting more aggressively as they're trying to defend their den from perceived threats. So I don't know if you heard about earlier, you know, this year in springtime in Sacramento, there was a coyote den. It was really, it was in a cold, forgetting if it was on a sidewalk or anyway, but near where people, you know, were regularly walking and they ended up um, CDFW and kind of blocking off that area um, because, you know, the coyotes were always there and weren't very happy about people regularly walking. But this time of year is when you may field calls from people who are going about what's their usual behavior. You know, they potentially have a set time, you know, before or after work that they always walk their dog on this same path. And all of a sudden they're having coyotes and they're concerned about them. And sometimes just explaining about the denning and time of year and how the behavior may change as the pups grow older and disperse, um, sometimes that's enough to quell people's fears and trying to convince people to try a new route um, for you know, the next few months if they're willing, if there's another route available. And both first year male and females are reproductive. And coyotes are really interesting in that they can adjust their litter sizes based on food availability and population density. So if you go through and do remove, lethally remove many coyotes in an area, but they still have the same food availability, um, coyotes are actually able to increase how many pups they have in a particular litter. So what about when the public doesn't want their neighborhood coyote? They've had enough. Um, and this happens, as I'm sure you guys have dealt with. Um, first off, explaining that it is illegal to capture and relocate wildlife in California. People's first reaction is often, well, I don't want to kill it, but I don't want it to live here. And unfortunately, they don't have the option to move it. And why not, right? Often I get pushback when I explain this to people. And that's just because they don't understand the reasons. So why can't we just capture and move an animal, right? And go live somewhere else. I still want it to live free, but just not here. Well, moving animals may be only moving the problem, right? If you're having an issue with this animal now, maybe your neighbor will. It also has the potential for spreading disease, which is a huge risk and a really big problem because you, you know, if you haven't thoroughly tested an animal, you don't know what diseases it may be carrying. And you're also dropping this animal in an area that probably already has other coyotes, which is just going to lead to ter territorial disputes in which the relocated animal could be injured or even killed. And you're also putting this animal into an unknown area where it doesn't know where to get food, where to find water, where to get shelter. <coughs> you <can> it. <coughs> Which isn't fair. Andy, come here. Andy. Inevitable. Sorry about that. And uh <coughs> When removing an animal, it's also helpful, or people don't think about necessarily what the longer term impacts of that is. So here's a little graphic. Let's say your home is in the middle of this red square, right? And I have this for mountain lions, but it'd be the same for coyotes or many other species. And each box is representing that animal's home range. And coyotes, just like mountain lions, are territorial. So let's say we remove the individual outlined, whose uh, territory is outlined in red. So they're gone. Now, maybe you'll have a single individual come and perfectly fill in that empty home range, right? That could happen, unusual, but you'd be very lucky, but that could happen. But what if you actually have the home ranges shift so that all of a sudden, Oh, messed up the box on this. Um, you have multiple animals move in. And so now instead of one coyote, you're actually going to have a few whose 
edges of their territory are going to overlap with your house. And that's an unintended consequence of altering population dynamics. So I like to tell people that, you know what, if you have this one individual animal, especially if so far it's not causing any damage, um, not posing a threat, it's you know not acting aggressively, it's in your best interest to keep that animal there because it's keeping out all of the other animals, uh, um, individuals, you know, that are competing to try to have that home range as well, because you don't know those other animals that could come in. So if your neighborhood coyote is doing its own thing, it's keeping out other coyotes that could potentially cause more damage or more problems for you. Um, so really learning to live if, you know, it's not it's very aggressive or, you know, which is unusual for the most part, coyotes are going to do their own thing. Um, so if you just respect them and take measures, which I'll talk about next, um, to help prevent the potential for conflict, you want that animal to remain. So what can we do, um, especially with coyotes? There's actually a lot. So of course, number one, removing attractants. Um, people often think like, oh right, trash, pet food, um, those are definitely attractants. But people also forget that bird seed and compost can also be attractants. Um, so, you know, someone doing the right thing, composting, they care about the environment. Um, but if they're in coyote area, they are going to want to think about, um, you know, keeping it in some kind of, you know, bin or some way that coyotes are not going to have access to the compost pile or just, you know, keeping it depending upon the size of your property, keeping it far from your house, um, that sort of thing where, you know, be aware that wherever you're putting it, you could potentially be attracting coyotes. Also removing ground level shrubbery that coyotes can hide in, especially, you know, if you have a little kid um, not having really thick shrubbery right next to, let's say, your play structure, that can be um, a good mitigation method. Um, for fences, people often think, oh, well, I have this, you know, six foot tall wooden fence. There's no way a coyote could get in. Um, that's not true. T coyotes, they can jump pretty well. They can climb. Um, a six foot fence on its own is not going to be coyote proof. Um, they can also dig under. So if you really want to make sure um, that you're minimizing the odds of a coyote getting in, you could have what's called, um, oh, I forgot the TM, sorry, coyote roller. It's a, um, a brand where you place it on top of the fence and it can prevent um, coyotes from jumping over. You can also bury a no dig skirt um, at the base of the fence coming out um, to make sure they're not able to dig under. So people, you know, if they want to try to scare a coyote off, um, you know, if one, if they do see one in their backyard, um, you can try an air gun or a can with pebbles or coins, something really loud um, that coyotes aren't gonna wanna hear. Um, if you do encounter a coyote, reminding people that they should never run away, um, even an adult, you shouldn't run, um, that can trigger a chase response. And of course, we often think of that with mountain lions, don't run, or with bears, um, but it's the same with coyotes. You don't want to want to run away from them. And if a person is bitten, you should immediately contact CDFW or law enforcement. So what about hazing? Um, Hazing is widely talked about um, and many um, organizations heavily promote it. Um, I do have to say that there isn't much scientific evidence that shows whether hazing actually is an effective tool. Anecdotally, I've heard lots of stories of people saying hazing was really effective for them, um, but I have to remind people that um, from a scientific point of view, the jury is still out. And the colleague I mentioned who's collaring coyotes down in Southern California, that's actually the purpose of that collaring. Um, so I'm really excited to see the results of her study. Um, but what they're doing is collaring coyotes and then um, doing community hazing and to see whether that hazing is um, altering the coyotes movements and behavior in a way that people want, right? We don't, we want them um, being more respectful of people in these suburban areas. So stay tuned, maybe in a few years or 
or sooner, um, she or I'd be able to uh, report on that. Neem uh, Quinn, I'm sure you guys probably met her. She's fantastic. Also at UC ANR. Um, but if people are really interested in hazing, um, certainly remind them that they should never put themselves in a position where they're um, putting themselves in danger. Uh, you know, these animals, they have teeth, right? <laughs> they can bite. So be careful. Um, don't get too close, right? You, you don't want to put yourself in a position where you could potentially get hurt. Um, if an animal is far off, you know, 100 meters or even like, you know, 70 meters doing its own thing, acting like a normal coyote, don't try to haze that individual, right? We only want to haze when they're starting to do something that we don't want them to do. And hazing can include, you know, using an air gun, using pots and pans, even just yelling, um, spraying them with a hose, doing something that makes them uncomfortable, that'll make them um, stop doing what they're doing and move further from you. So with that, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate you guys virtually coming to listen to my presentation. Um, I was hoping that we could open up the discussion to talk more about um, the different conflicts you face on a day-to-day -day basis. And then, um, you know, depending upon if there is some common uh, common themes that people have, maybe we could work together um, to try to, you know, name and frame kind of some uh, example situations or how you might approach a person um, when you're trying to deal with this conflict um, using the naming and framing approach. So 